Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 15. This is the podcast listener Q&A spectacular, is I think what I tried to call it online when I was soliciting questions. Yes, it's spectacular, Matt. Here with me today is Orion. Hey, what's up? And also Matt. I feel spectacular. <laughs> today we're going to be answering some questions from our listeners, which is really fun. Let's learn about us. Are you guys ready? I'm I'm ready. I'm I've so wanted ready to learn about <laughs> you. For a you long seem time. so excited, Orion. <laughs> it's been yeah, no, I'm ready. I guess I'll I'll start with the questions and then we'll just go left around the table. So then so I'll start I'll ask the questions and we'll go Ryan, then Matt, then me. Oh, okay. And just go in a circle. Does that sound good? That sounds reasonable, but although I imagine there'll be lots of interplay. Yes, we okay. can mock each other. We can mock. You can we can or mock ask we could we can even jeer. It's possible that you might have an opinion that I find insightful, and then I'll ask, I'll ask you a, a question about it. You sound like that would be an unlikely occurrence. I, I'm i just listing, giving one possible happening. Okay. Let's start with some biographical favorites kind of thing. Not really biographical. It's favorites. For it's the favorites. Five questions in this section, start with favorite. Yes. Ryan, what are your favorite movies? Favorite movies? Uh, probably The Matrix. Uh, I really uh, like Shawshank Redemption. Uh, probably the movie I've seen most recently that I really liked was Chef. Really like that one. Um, Star Wars, of course. Love yeah. The Rings. Star Wars, of course. Love the Rings. I, I'm not going to say much. But I think The Matrix and Shawshank Redemption are two of the most overrated movies. <laughs> Mark Mark has like just a couple opinions on movies. Just a couple. Uh, Matt, what are your favorite movies? Um. Okay. First thing I wrote down was Star Wars, followed by Lord of the Rings. That's uh, a good start. Return, Return of the King, especially. Return of the King is amazing. Yeah, like if I could only watch one movie franchise for the rest of my life it would be peter jackson's lord of the rings really over star wars ah that's really tough as a universe i'm into star wars more but i would go with the the lord of the rings movies i would probably agree with that yeah yeah so other things i i kind of had trouble with this question uh memento in like primer, those oh, like mind that memento has to be the movie yeah. that I hate so much. Like our opinions <laughs> differ on that movie really? more than probably any other movie. For a long time, I said memento was my favorite movie. I wouldn't say that anymore, but I I, I love those mind bending. Yeah, primer was really. I like both of those. I primer like, is I crazy. Like primer is just a straight up like mind. I liked primer. I just yeah. hated memento. Yeah, hunt for the red October. That's a good one. Um, so the movies that like are stuck in my head right now, these these are like off Mark's list because Mark shows me movies. Yeah, yeah. Or like, no Country for Old Men and Tree of Life are just like amazing movies that I think about all the time. Like I need to watch those again. <laughs> yeah, we should watch those again. Those are actually the first two on my list. So my three, I like movies a lot, and I like looking into movies a lot. And I think I've solidified my top tier of movies are Tree of Life, No Country for Old Men, and The Third Man. Although, maybe one day out of the week, I'll change the Coen Brothers entry from No Country to A Serious Man. But six hmm. out of the seven days, it's No Country. What about Close Encounters? Close Encounters is my favorite sci-fi movie. Okay. But it doesn't hit that top tier. All right. It is an amazing movie, though. Favorite music? What have you guys been listening to? Well, I, I like going back to my classic rock. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this is, you know... Uh, definitely from my father, but uh, ACDC, yeah. uh, Boston. I like the you know the band Boston as well as the city, but uh, I have never really gotten into Led Zeppelin as much. That's a shame. What about Pink Floyd? I like some Pink Floyd songs. Um, I like some Cars. I don't love the Eagles. They have some good songs, but I don't love them. Um. Other genres, uh, going back to my childhood, Switchfoot and Reliant K are just iconic bands for me. Nice. Um, 
more of their older stuff. I haven't listened to as much of their more recent stuff. Uh, I also like the kind of techno, bass hunter style music. Um, oh, yeah. That's that's going back to when we were roommates in college. Yeah, I remember you played that, and that quickly became one of my favorites. Yeah, for late night study. Yeah. Well, uh, I just the other week I went back to, and then there were none. And that was a blast from the past and excellent work music if you ever need to program or anything like that. All right, Matt, you're the music person. Yeah, I... I'm I very curious music. who you're going to say. My, my opinion, my, my music tastes are very wide. Without question, my favorite band is Me Without You, front to back of their dis- discography. I'm so pumped they're coming to Boston in a couple months. Yep. Playing the album that I like least... If I could only have one band, it would be Me Without You. Other things, uh, I put like Josh Garrels and the Oh Hellos together. Okay. But I think just write... Folky stuff. Folk, uh, but just beautiful albums, co- you know, coherent. I'm a big sucker for concept albums or mm-hmm. pseudo-concept albums. And I think Garrels and the Oh Hellos do that. Mute Math, especially their old stuff. The first album is so like, good. I think their first album is... The first thing I listened to and was like front to back, and then I had to listen to it front to back again, and just finding layers and layers. And then I like I like some metal, under oath, Skylit Drive. That's kind of like workout music. And uh, I wanted to say August Tr- Burns Red. I August like Burns Red, yeah. But then also some EDM stuff Orion has showed me in the past. John Hopkins. Oh yeah, you keep talking about this yeah, guy. Yeah. So I so. He's been described as writing short electronic symphonies. And I think that kind of gets at it. Mm. I, he's so good. I got to listen to that again. I, I'm skeptical. I my could music taste, on and on. So, my know. music tastes are very... What happens is I'll find a band and I'll like them. And then I'll listen to nothing but that band for like a month. And so the last five musical artists i have listened to have been me without you thanks to matt they're fantastic i know orion hates them uh sufjan stevens i've really gotten into his stuff typhoon which is a random band i found through npr's tiny desk concerts which if you haven't seen that on youtube that's a great resource radiohead they're awesome and then a ton of Kendrick Lamar, which is my first foray into hip hop. <laughs> and I think I started with the best and I've tried a couple other hip hop artists and I just don't want to listen to them. I'd rather just listen to Kendrick. He's, I think, legitimately a genius. But that's why I've been listening to recently. Uh, Pink Floyd, though, would be my classic rock band of choice, I think. I think uh, the Wish You Were Here album is just perfection. The whole album. If there's a genre that I wish I could get into, it's classic rock. I know you like them. I remember you playing them in, in college, Orion. Yeah. Um, I, I, like I, just, I don't I like... I haven't quite gotten there. I don't listen to music or pay as much attention to it as either of you do. Um, I just listen to enjoy it. So that's why I have things like Boston or ACDC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have these more like, well, the concept album has this great theme and it taught me how to listen to music. And I just like... It's well, I thing. only listen to albums. Like I can't stand I the radio. To yeah, I I have I listen to listen to, to albums. Front I'm in to back. agreement with albums. The difference between us, Mark, is that I love the live show, and I love experiencing the live show. I like and live shows. I just like. But you want? I like sit. listening to them to the to them sitting down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and like I like the vis- visceral experience of just like. The, the love between the artist and the fans. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Favorite books. I think I know your answer, Ryan. I think it's a trilogy, and I think it's a science fiction trilogy. This one is so hard. There's so many. I've read a lot of books. Recently, I've really liked a lot of the Brandon Sanderson books. Mm-hmm. Um, the Stormlight Archives. Um, I like the whole Mistborn series. I wouldn't put those as my favorite, but I like that universe. Uh, I like Dresden. I've read all those a couple times. Love those. I really enjoyed Tom Clancy, reading Tom Clancy novels. I've never actually read a Tom That's Clancy like my novel. my go-to airport, airplane book. It's just the perfect book to just sit on the airplane and read for six hours. I have seen Tom. 
I, that's weird because he's a novelist. Yeah. But I've I've seen Tom Clancy movies and I've played Tom Clancy video games, but I never read one of his books. Yeah. Recently, I, I think Mark's referring to the Thrawn trilogy, which is a Star Wars. Set that's of not books. what I was referring to. Oh, actually, I, I like that trilogy. It wouldn't be my favorite, but if you're looking for Star Wars legacy universe, I would recommend that. I've read some of the new young adult fiction, and I would not particularly recommend it. <laughs> oh, and for star- the new canon stuff for yeah, Star Wars? I mean, if you're really into Star Wars, sure, read it. And I'm not ashamed that I read it, but it's not genius. Yeah. I don't even know. There's so many books. I thought you told me once that the Foundation Trilogy is your favorite. Oh, the, yeah. Foundation Trilogy. If you want sci-fi, that is the starting place. That is probably the best sci-fi I've ever read. Huh. It's just, it's immaculate. Though I talked, I mentioned this to Kyle when I was visiting back in California, and he hates the Foundation really? Trilogy. Yeah. That's so now I, I really I really need to read it. I need to get back to my classic sci-fi. I read a ton of Ray Bradbury and a bit of Asimov when I was in high school, but I have yeah. took Again, a giant a break from fiction. Sci-fi books, so that's yeah, your dad's of... a huge nerd. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Isn't doesn't he collect comic books? He used to. Okay, he used cool. to have thousands and thousands of comic. Books. Nice. All right, Matt. Do you have any books cool. that are not Star Wars on this list? I don't have any Star Wars books. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I I read like a one of the I don't know, the Jedi Kids series, and then like I said, I've read some of the recent young adult fiction as my like I don't know popcorn fair books. But no, I've never read Star Wars. Oh, okay. In like a like eating it up kind of manner i've no. read so much star wars like yeah. back in high school or in my teenage years i probably read 50 or 60 star wars novels just like yeah. everything the library had. i probably read like 20 i can't remember the name of the series but it was like master and apprentice it was obi-wan and qui-gon oh yeah i remember that series it was fun i probably read 20 of them but mm-hmm. no i mean if i had to go with uh sort of like a children's young adult series like hardy boys i read all i, I probably read uh, i read a bunch of those I read my dad's i think I hardy read. boys and then i read all the new ones i read all the old ones i think yeah. i think i read all the nancy drews too uh, but i mean that's been box Children. but that's you know, been yeah. 15 years another you know? uh, kind of fantasy series Redwall. i read all of those okay. growing up yeah. a couple times is that each. the one with mice yeah okay I've, I've heard of them stuff so okay so the, i only have a couple books that i thought of for nonfiction, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman oh, yeah. probably had the biggest impact on me of any any nonfiction, you know. We're going to uh, write about that at some point soon. The just book that I've, I've ever read. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, I think his ideas are, well, his ideas are applicable to any media, including board game. I'm not sold on that, but I'm really curious about yeah. when we write the article. Yeah. Another fantasy yeah, se- and- series I have to mention is Harry Potter. I read that for the first time think after college and just love that too I'm, I'm sure there's other non-fiction i've read a lot of non-fiction too but recently it's been a lot of fantasy so that's what comes to mind yeah i think postman's ideas really impacted how i think of how i, I live in a modern world even though you know he'd probably be ashamed of the things i do he, <laughs> he'd probably be uh disappointed in my music choices <laughs> but um let's say getting into fiction brave new world like you're still writing the postman theme here yeah yeah and, and honestly <laughs> i don't know yeah that's what i came didn't actually my... like brave new world that much I really as a liked book it. i really enjoyed it but i was reading it not all that long after reading postman mm-hmm. but like i just read 1984 fairly recently for the first time yeah and yeah it was it was great super impactful but with postman as a tutor from amusing ourselves to death, I couldn't help but being impacted by Brave New World more mm-hmm. than 1984. Sure. So anyway, so there's that. Those are two of my favorites. Um, the other fiction books, Narnia. I, oh, they're I, the best. I still go back and read Narnia. And um, also C.S. Lewis' The Great Divorce. Um, That's a good one. Yeah, which I just think is a beautiful story that kind of depicts heaven. C.S. Lewis's fiction is just so rich and and simple all right my books the books i've read recently i took a huge break from fiction after college and i didn't read much fiction in college but i recently got back in with patrick rothfuss's books name of the wind and wise man's fear which are legitimately amazing those are they're amazing yeah they're so good and matt you you still haven't read it right 
No, I'm the only one. I'm In the, the whole only, group. I'm the only acquaintance of Ben that hasn't read it. <laughs> You've got to read these books. You will, you will be blown away. And then recently I've been reading through again because of Ben, because he's our, I guess him and Orion are our big uh, fantasy novel nerds. Uh, I've been reading through the Dresden Files and they're enjoyable. I like it. But but all time my favorite book is The Confessions of St. Augustine. It has, it completely changed my life in college. And then I've just been collecting and reading various translations since then. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I have four different translations right now. I um I aspire to read and like understand that. I've never gotten all the way through it, but um just I've only gotten all the way through it once. I, I mostly like the first half of the book. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. The autobiographical part. All right, YouTube channels that you guys uh would recommend. We'll say non board gaming one, because there's a board game one uh question later on. Well I'm looking at my subscriptions here. It's a lot of uh video game related ones. I've been into fantasy football a lot more this year, especially the uh, DraftKings daily fantasy thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so for that, I really like Fantasy Labs and Rotor Grinders. I really enjoy their content. Uh, I think one of my favorite stream I'm not sure if he's my favorite, but one of my favorite streamers would be Flurry Worry on Twitch and YouTube. What's he do? I've never heard of him. He does Paradox games, uh, oh, especially that's Europa, right. but he has... 15,000 hours in the game or something insane and so he's constantly doing these super ambitious campaigns to start with a mongol horde and turn it into poland and break the game with all these modifiers to make his cavalry four times as effective or something stupid (laughs) like that or start as the pope and become iceland and conquer the entire world in 20 years after that because he stacked all the modifiers to core stuff or just insane things like that and that's what, my favorite game right now, so I, I enjoy him. Yeah, I don't, I don't watch a whole lot. Number file is super cool. <laughs> yeah, I just watch. I watch probably like one in five, but they're always super cool. Lessons from screenplay. Lessons from the screenplay. Is I've a, never heard of this. Is a is movie that... one. I saw his his episode on the Social Network, and it it's he just can explain movies super well. And I know there are a bunch of movie channels out there. Don't worry, I'll mention them. But okay, okay. So I'll, I'll stop it. <laughs> I I have way more time for audio than video, though. That's right. You're more of a podcasting person. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Mine. I I I'll second number file. That's just a really cool mathy. It's like for someone who doesn't understand math, for me, it makes me feel intelligent because <laughs> yes. it's all explained very simply. Tested Adam Savage's YouTube channel. Have you guys looked at his stuff at all? No. no. It's a fun YouTube channel, okay. DIY, you know, cool. making, building stuff yourself kind of thing. And they have a cool podcast where they just chat uh, on the YouTube channel. Binging with Babish is really fun. He makes food from movies and TV shows, no matter how okay. ridiculous they are. And he's made some really ridiculous stuff. But along the way, he's actually a very good chef and he shows a lot of cool techniques. Huh. Uh, and his videos are only like four minutes long. And then... My two favorite movie channels are Cinefix, who do really, really, really high quality, like top 10 lists, among other things. But really, their top 10 lists are really good. And the, the single best YouTube movie channel I've ever found is Every Frame of Painting. He, but he only does like one video every two months. But they're the best video essays I th- I've ever seen on movies. Like It's like a film class. He's so good. Those are my favorite ones. All right. Any other board game podcasters or reviewers that you, that you guys follow? Uh, for me, I, not so much general board games stuff, but uh, a lot of Netrunner. I've listened yeah. to a ton of oh, very cool uh, the Winning Agenda and Run Last Click. Uh, both of their podcasts are really excellent. I love their stuff. I've listened to hundreds and hundreds of episodes from them on YouTube. Metropole Metropole Grid is really mm-hmm. good. He's he, great. Uh, Near Reading Grid does great uh, game commentary, and Ben, oh, what's his Ben Nee, Ben Nee's uh, channel Bioken. Yeah. He does some really good videos. So yeah. those are my favorite channels there. I really like Cardboard with Rich Summer. That's a fun one. Yeah, so I've he, called in on that one. Yeah, yeah, and, and that was the first episode I listened to, and I've listened to all the episodes since. But yeah, so he just like he loves games and talking about gaming experiences, and I think. He does does that really well, so I, that's fun. He's just and he's really enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. 
I think he he does what he does really well. I also really like the Shut Up and Sit Down podcast. I think it's probably my favorite Shut Up and Sit Down media, actually. Really? Um, yeah, I, I think... I don't always agree with their gaming opinions, but I think on the podcast, they they touch a lot of things and express like their you know why they like or don't like games really well and, mm. and they're hilarious so that's yeah they're they're definitely uh, hilarious those, those are the only two that i listen to with any regularity yeah i keep kind of an eye on shut up and sit down in the dice tower just poking at stuff that seems interesting but don't i don't i don't watch or read them religiously the best board game podcast other than this one of course that i found is ludology they really go into some crazy academic stuff about board games and it's really entertaining although i've kind of stopped listening to to ludology uh, recently because i'm paranoid of accidentally plagiarizing them and then i will second metropol grid that's absolutely my favorite netrunner resource but i'm not a huge podcast guy even though I make a pod. I enjoy making a podcast a whole lot more than I do listening to one. Well, I listen on the way to work. Yeah, that's and sometimes true. at lunch. Yeah. So I just need to get out of the office and I go for a walk and listen to a podcast or yeah. eat out on a bench or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm like that. I I think I easily average an hour a day of podcasts. Nice. Here we got another question. It says I find it interesting that often the most recognizable faces in the hobby are reviewers rather than designers or artists or publishers. What other hobbies reflect this prominent role of the media? I'm going to take this one first. I think it's just a product of of the, being in the 21st century. And the other, the only time you would have really recognizable reviewers is if in book reviewing, if some like big name writer did a book review, that would be interesting. And then a couple of movie reviewers gain national prominence, like Ebert and Siskel and. Um, there's a, a woman before that who I cannot remember her name. But then since then, like, now we have video games where streamers are, you know, much more recognizable than the people who make video games. And that's the the uh, explosion of Twitch and all the and YouTube platforms and YouTube over yeah. the last decade or so. Yeah, I think you're right in that it's pretty much a product of the internet culture. Uh, you know, cons- just it's so easy to consume people's creative work well it's it's also there's a re- significantly reduced cost of entry to becoming someone who reviews yeah, yeah, or tries to yeah. stream like it's yeah. super yeah. It's cheap you know compared to you know historically yeah. the comparison i th- the comparisons i thought of and this is just purely a product of like how much time i you know where i spend my time online are um the hockey world like no one really cares about what any what hockey players have to say or think like the people i know are like the media personalities whether they be analytics people or or like old school sports people i don't this this is probably less sports in general there's a lot of media personalities that yeah like uh, they don't i mean there's the superstars that are the best known right and a step down from that you get a lot of media personalities yeah and maybe yeah. just because hockey doesn't have like the like you know the Le- lebron james personality mm-hmm. that like people care about but I think there. I think just in sports, I think it's it's similar. Yeah, it's somewhat similar. And and there's an interesting evolution there where you have really iconic voices like on radio broadcasts back in the day and on TV broadcasts, and then you get uh, ESPN and Sports Center, which had its own kind of celebrities, you know, that came up with it in what the mm-hmm. '80s that came Sports Center came out or know. early '90s maybe, and then. That just kind of opens the door into this, again, transition into the digital age where now everyone's their own amateur sports statistician or something. Although I think it might be a lot more prominent in hockey. I wonder if that's partially because they're so like physically covered up in hockey. Oh, like they man. are in football too, but football has the excuse that it's the I mean, most popular sport in America. I think a large part of it is they're mostly Canadian. That it's true. They're, they're they're all Canadian or, or Russian. <laughs> if I if I can grossly generalize the Canadian personality, and also there's <laughs> there's a lot more of like you know European Russian players in the American league that I don't know maybe it's harder 
for well, it, it's harder to are... just like promote there aren't a whole lot of american stars in the nhl yeah but there aren't a lot i guess there's more of a percentage in hockey than in like baseball but baseball's still like 30 percent hispanic i don't know i think the only time you see reviewers being more prominent than what they're reviewing is when it comes to like youtube broadcasts or what about like food channels and shows and stuff i thought about that but there's not most of those people are actual chefs to some degree Mm -hmm. so the the food critics aren't as popular as the like legit food critics like no one knows who they are okay Um, i don't think it's true in music because music i think is largely like cult of personality and like it feels like mtv has lost relevance well, and then, like, music criticism, like, has never been that important. Yeah, I mean, like... Well, music's a lot, a whole lot harder to evaluate, too. So it's a much more difficult. That's an interesting question. Moving on to games themselves, looking at actual parts of games. Uh, the question is, what do you think of the form versus function debate? My first thought here is that it's encouraging that, like, it seems like recently we're to a point where a lot of games do both great Mm -hmm. that was my first reaction and and it's harder to get away with not doing i guess not doing form well (laughs) yeah not having good art you mean or high production value yeah uh, just general production value yeah but but is one in particular more important to you do you think one needs to be more important Mark's th- looking at me. I as think if. I think the form is important <laughs> in board gaming, just like movies, in that it is a sensory experience in some part, and so yeah, you do actually well look at it, and you do actually physically care what these things, you know, look like and move like and feel like and all of that. I tend to be much more a function over form sort of person, and you know, I love chess, and I love I'm yeah. an engineer, and I like I think and generally pretty rational and utilitarian sort of ways. I think part of board gaming is the experience of it, and that part is drastically enhanced by having a better form than I think I think in modern board gaming we're we're kind of we're past abstract games. And right. I the, think a modern game is a lot different than Go. <laughs> to, to, I mean to say that form doesn't matter, I think is to say that you prefer I don't know, chess and go and checkers or whatever. And I love those games. But yeah, absolutely. I probably enjoy, I... say, Rebellion or something like Scythe that's so yeah. thematic like that much yeah. more or generally more than the kind of raw strategy of go and right, chess. But, yeah, I'm, like, I'm trying to think of like what would be a great Euro even, which is, you know, all about the systems and stuff like that without like a prototype of some euro that doesn't have any artwork and is all like very basic pieces i guess i mean we'd play that right mark but i'm not sure that we would we wouldn't enjoy it as much we wouldn't enjoy it as much i'm not sure that we would find it worthy of bringing to the table yeah this is i I found this question very interesting because this is a big pet peeve of mine in movies is when people bring up like a form versus function debate and in movies in particular i'm very firmly in the stance that it's a complete false dichotomy you cannot separate the two at all the form is the function right the the choices you make artistically and the way you edit the medium is the message kind of yeah and they're both together it's a bit easier i guess to separate it out with board games because you can imagine the prototype that literally is just like numbers on pieces of paper. Yeah. But I still think there's a lot that's tied together. Like you guys are talking about chess and go, but there's a really unique visual feeling that you get from those games because they're abstract and the, and the components are so sparse. Even that form which is sparse and abstract, serves the experience. Right. And if you had, like, you could have, like, a really super ostentatious chess set, and it would feel worse, I think, than a kind of your basic, really elegant chess set. 
or you could imagine go with like miniatures or something you know just because you know miniatures are better than stones but it would not be but there's something pure about the i don't know the the push and pull area control of placing stones on a grid oh yeah it goes beautiful it's a beautiful game so i think there's a lot you can't separate there you know, I think, but when we get to like modern games, like I'm looking at our our shelf, how many of these games would be worth playing if they were made with generic components? You know, you know, just like cardboard chits and stuff. Well, a lot of them are. A lot of them are made with cubes and meeples and you know numbers and. But I'm not saying that okay. form isn't important. I'm saying that f- whatever formatic, I don't know, whatever choices they make with art in design is part of the function of the game. I'm not saying you could strip it away. I'm saying it's important enough to be considered as part of the experience of the game. Like, you know, particularly with board games and graphic design decisions where it's, it's really part of the, you know, how the game communicates with you about its rules and its mechanisms. So how about Twilight Struggle, which is in a sense, like, as close to chess as modern board gaming gets in a lot of ways. Sure. What if all the cards were just like blank white cards with with the influence values and... And the text? And it, like the pure functional action of, of the, the card in text with no Cold War references or art. I think it'd be pretty much the same. I don't pay attention to the art. Really? No, the Cold War comes through okay. not because the actions... I don't have knowledge of necess- of most of the historical context of Twilight Struggle. The Cold War is communicated through other mechanisms. It's not communicated through the title of the cards as much. I mean, it is a little bit. All right, I haven't played it nearly as much as... as but again, have. I'm not saying that form isn't important. I'm saying it's very important. But not because, oh, it looks pretty, but because it's part of the function of the game twilight struggle wouldn't work nearly as well if it didn't have a cold war theme because it's in all of its mechanisms are giving putting you in the place of of an actor in the cold war struggle to make you feel the the experience oh i completely agree you could still play the game but i i can't imagine it being enjoyable yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we're not no, disagreeing. Um, here. No, we're not disagreeing. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of my stance on it. But I think going back to movies real quick, I think it's a horrible, horrible debate in quotation marks that people bring up in movies. It makes no sense at all. And if you think that there's a debate there, stop it. Moving on. Stop it. How important are art and component qualities to you in terms of evaluating the game? So in other words, does a game with better art deserve a higher score than it otherwise would get with, you know, run of the mill or, or, you know, average art? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, simple answer. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, this is a continuation of the last question. Yeah. But I think that the, the art should serve the gameplay experience and i think you said it really well like for chess the elegance is serving the gameplay experience so as it you know it doesn't need to be ostentatious or or whatever but i think for a lot of yeah i know for like viticulture the art serves the gameplay experience i think And, and and if viticulture was like completely half-assed and i don't know cartoony rather than elegant whiny (laughs) um whiny as in wine the drink the the, yes i think it would detract and i would give it a a lower score yeah taking something like scythe if you made all the pieces like big colored big cubes and small cubes of your color it would be so much worse than it is yeah absolutely yeah yeah i think i think some games are more enhanced by their art than others but i think good art definitely lifts all games to be better than they otherwise would be and it needs to serve the gameplay experience when you're playing a game it's an experience yeah i think you hit the nail on the head some games is more important than others dominion uh because the text on the cards is so important i think because it 
oftentimes doesn't have the best art that doesn't matter as much yeah but in other games it does matter a lot and to me it's a game where i pay so much less attention to the art than many other games yeah yeah and it's so much more about just thinking about what is this card doing right i feel like i like the art in dominion more than my sense of what a lot of people feel about it but yeah no i think you're right i think dominion works more well, in let's think about it. We used spin. to play on the old Isotropic site with almost no art. Great right? point. Great point. And yep. we love the game there because we love Dominion. Yeah, so that's a case, it, I, and it really comes into comes back to the individual experience of the game. You know, Matt, you talked about the experience of it, and for me, when I'm looking at a game I'm a, and I'm reviewing it, I'm trying to find a rating. I start with okay, what's my overall experience of the game? What does that? Okay. What rating do I get from that experience? And that's how I rate the game. I don't write the review first and then rate it. Like add up a rating. Well, yeah, I certainly don't do that. But I don't I don't let the review dictate my the rating. I let the the rating dictate the review. Because if I can't then go out and write a review and justify that rating, I've got to reevaluate my experience again. Okay. But it starts with that experience and sometimes the art is very important to that. I mean, Firefly would be a much worse game. If you yeah. didn't have that amazing art and graphic design, I think and, Archipelago. And like all the quotes and the tie-ins yeah. to events in the movies. Uh, BSG is so much enhanced by ties into the universe and the setting. Yeah. and the. Uh, I mean, Archipelago, I think, is maybe the most yeah, beautiful think... game we've played. That helps it a bit. But very specifically, I think also really, really tight graphic design can just make games amazing great point that we haven't brought up um and the two examples i would give would be dominant species which i think just nails not i mean the design's very elegant but the way it's presented on the game board is just perfect and then venos which communicates a ton of information on a very busy board but once you kind of get the gist of it it's very very nicely designed i was going to say terra mystica Oh, Terra Mystica 2 is particularly with those really nice, bright, boards. vibrant colors in the player boards, the Scythe player boards, of course, uh, which take Terra Mystica and then improve on it. But things like using consistent iconography, like in Terra Mystica, oh, yeah. like the hand under whatever means you get this as income or, what, you know, things mm-hmm. like is that. It, it is it, it Terra so Mystica where the game where like all the plastic pieces can be used in one way and all the wooden no, pieces. No, scythe. Scythe, yes. Yeah, yeah all the anything which, made of plastic can be in combat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which I when I figured that out, it took me a little bit to figure it out, but I love that cuz it's just a simple design decision. Yeah. That just makes it easier to to understand what's going on. Yeah, and the, and those kinds of decisions combined with what you would call the art, although it's a lot of the same things, right? That creates the experience of the game so in that sense the game you know art art can certainly improve the rating of the game but i don't look at it like okay this game's a five but it looks amazing so i'm going to give it a six no i start with the whole experience of the game and then What's the game? can you think of any games that are held back by poor form washington's war was kind of annoying but i think millennium blades while through the ages <laughs> Oh, through the ages, those little cylinders. This is the, I think the new version fixed it, right? Yeah. yeah. The new it. version fixed it, but on the original version of Through the Ages, the little tiny cylinder wooden pieces for like almost everything you do is one of the worst component decisions I've ever seen in a game. I mean, they're when, so annoying. When the component design and iconography is, is difficult and you have to expend brain power. Oh, so yeah. That detracts from the game, especially in heavy games. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and that that is worth considering. Well, I think Millennium Blades is an interesting example because it has some really cool art, but it's so busy on the table that it can often be difficult to figure out what's happening, even though like individual cards look really awesome. And overall, you would say the art is good it doesn't necessarily add up to a to a great graphic or visual design although i still really like millennium blades when you do the 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 bounded money 
you're just going to be ridiculous and you you don't really it is a game of excess for sure (laughs) yeah let's move on to the next question someone just asked what are our favorite mechanics although there's a strange i have a strange pet peeve that i hate when people call them mechanics because i feel like that should be called mechanisms because a mechanic's a person who fixes a car although you know know. the english language is i'm not a prescriptivist so it's and if you were you would be wrong (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right favorite mechanics or mech ah now the it's got me doing it favorite ah. mechanisms orion favorite mechanisms <laughs> uh, okay i'll just take the easy one yeah in scythe when you do the upgrade action you move the cube from oh, the top yeah. of the board to the bottom and it covers up a little icon on the bottom or it covers up a cost on the bottom and opens up a, a payment on the top I forgot about uh, that one i think we should all just sigh together to express how much we love that Ready? <sighs> yeah. It's, a, sort of it's, a, great, in, it's a great um, part of Scythe. Terra Mystica. I'm trying to think of other examples where you place a thing and you uncover information underneath it on the player board or something like that. I can't think of any others. I mean, Scythe is still relatively That's new, but game design... There's a little notes. bit of that in Through the Ages. Kind of. More abstracted. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, I... I thought real hard about this and had trouble coming up with things because I feel like I like a broad range of games. So I couldn't, I had trouble finding like themes, but um, one thing I love is in the more party game side of things is games that rely on forced connections. So like games where you're not trying to be correct or you're trying to be most efficient, but you're trying to be on the same page as other people. So Codenames, Mysterium, do this the best. I think games like Taboo do it. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. But there's just so many. Like deck building is great. Worker yeah. placement, but that's yeah, I think so when broad. people, I think I when like... people ask this question, they're looking for really broad categories. But I completely did not do that at all. I like the kind of dual victory tracks in War of the Ring. How you're oh, that's kind of good struggling one. on these two different axes. Yeah. Um, along with that idea of the... That's really cool. The GMT games have that. Not the really? same way. Like, in the coin games, you're struggling for different things. Like, some factions are struggling for... Like, in Fire in the Lake, the two factions care about support, and the other two factions care about control. And those are determined, sometimes related, but they're separate scores or statuses in each province. And so you take different actions to affect those things. In Triumph and Tragedy, I like how the cards are all multi-use. And so you use the ends for the... uh, Or you play it one way to use the political action. You play it the other way for your military actions. or And they affect two countries depending on which way you turn it. Yeah, I think if I was to pick a general category, multi-use cards maybe. Except that I haven't played a Carl Chuddick game that I've enjoyed... And he is apparently the best at multi-use cards, but I couldn't stand innovation. And Motna is really weird. Motna is super weird. It's really weird. I wanted to like innovation, but yeah, yeah, no, that I, that's a great one, guys. And, and like, just because every time you play something, you're just making a simple decision of is this card more valuable to me in use A or use B? Because mm-hmm. uh, you can only use it one way. Yeah. Right. And even if it's better and you say you you need something in B and it might be the best thing of your options to use it that way, even though you'd rather use it in A, you know, something like that. So I I went really specific with my favorite mechanisms and made and then wrote out a bunch and then I counted and there were 10 of them. So (laughs) surprise top 10 list, Mark's favorite mechanisms and board games. Number 10 is in Tzolkin, just the very, very simple choice that you have to place or you have to remove workers is creates so much tension and it really makes you think through time as as the game is designed to do and the way the gear goes around so you have to plan ahead you have to plan ahead yeah Yeah. Uh, and the fact that you can't like pass or you can't do both like it really focuses your your decision in a really tight and intense way the event cards in robinson crusoe is number nine uh how you you go off and do something you get this card something happens to you 
and then it'll come back to bite you later at some point. There's some consequence for your decision, for your actions. Some That's really well done. Beautifully thematic way. Uh, number eight, Netrunner, agenda advancing, both because it's a pun and just because it's a really fantastic, subtle catch-up mechanism where the corporation has to spend time and money to actually advance their win condition rather than in games like Hearthstone or Magic where if you're winning the game, it doesn't harm you to advance your win position. You just attack. Uh, so I think agenda advancing is really, really elegantly done. Number seven, the market and power grid. Just a really elegant, again, representation of, of how markets work mm-hmm. in it's just about the simplest, <laughs> the simplest way you could do it. Really well done. Number six, Agricola, the unfolding actions. The fact that you're unlocking new actions and basically like double to triple the size of the game as you play is such a cool mechanism because it helps you learn the game as you're playing it. And then in, once you know the game later on, it adds a little bit of strategy because you don't know exactly when the different actions are going to come out, but you know generally when they're going to come out. And it it broadens the game as you broaden your farm. It's uh, it's just beautiful. Number five, five tribes bidding system, which basically saves probably a mediocre game into something that's really fascinating, a really fascinating puzzle, the way they do the bidding there. Number four, we Ryan just talked about the asymmetry in Fire in the Lake is endlessly fascinating. All the different incentives and motivations involved with the different factions. The other thing I'll throw in on that is the the way they use the cards in the coin games to determine turn order. And oh, the yeah. The first two people get to go, and you see the card ahead, and you might pass or you might not. That's a really good one, too. Yeah, honorable mention for that. Number three, the speed bumps in Suburbia, which is just one of those ideas you're yeah. like, oh, I could have thought of that. Yeah. Like, it's just a, like, why didn't it happen before where you just, as you advance in points, you lose part of your income on points and money? First of all, again, it's thematic. It, but and it's another pun. <laughs> it, 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 it saves, like, a pure engine game where it's like, if you're he- ahead, you have the ability to get ahead more. Right, yeah. It, it, it totally... Puts a speed bump in the way. Brings that back to always being competitive. Yeah, it's really good. And then the top two, I think, are just phenomenal in the history of board gaming. Number two, the fact that when you play your opponent's card in Twilight Struggle for operations points, the event also happens. Yeah. It's just absolutely brilliant. It makes the game. It makes the game. It makes the game the best, you know, in my opinion, the best game ever. It's just a perfect, perfect mechanism, but barely edging it out as another just brilliant and perfect mechanism in the game is the fact that when you get victory points in dominion the cards go into your deck nice such a perfect mechanism and every single deck builder that does not have some form of that is probably worse for it yeah again that brings a runaway engine I think it, yeah. Listening to this, back like, to it's a lot of Earth. catch-up mechanisms. Yeah, yeah, but but it's not are... just like like oh, we have to throw something in so that people who aren't as good. No, they're get so this. seamlessly it, integrated it into makes the game. The game because you have to decide when to start throwing junk into your engine. Yeah, it makes the game. It not only provides a catch-up mechanism, but it enriches the strategy of the game. Same with Suburbia. Same with Netrunner. Netrunner, yeah. Twilight Struggle. <laughs> yeah. All these things that you want to do this action, but in doing so, it gets you closer to winning, but it also slows you down for the in the immediate yeah. time frame. So. Well, I guess that's that's really the definition of an elegant mechanism, right? If, it, if it's something simple. There's a push and pull. Well, it, well, it's something simple that accomplishes multiple things. Okay. It provides yeah. a catch-up mechanism, and it creates this really tough strategic decision in the game. At the same time. While being a critical action towards winning. <laughs> exactly. That too, yeah. While being hey, heavily incentivized to do it. Hey, Mark, that was a not bad list. Nice. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good list. We could have made a whole podcast off of that. Throw that in there for free. Tune listeners. in next week. <laughs> yeah, I'm just throwing out top 10 lists right and left. I don't care. It's fine. 
I gotta jump in with a few more broad mechanics that I know Mark just adores. Oh yeah. Uh, number one would be drafting. I do like drafting. Just yeah. like any form of yeah. drafting in games, you always love that. And uh, yeah. Oh yeah, and mystery bags. You and wrote that in the document. Mystery bags. Yeah. <laughs> I love mystery bags. Whenever Mark makes a game, it will probably be a drafting mystery bag game. I do like, want to make a drafting mystery bag game. With a hundred ways of choosing the first player. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, a caveat to Mark's earlier discussion about ratings. He does add 0. 0.5 to any game that has a mystery bag. Maybe subconsciously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I don't love mystery bags because of the mechanism. I just like reaching into a, a bag of mystery and pulling something out. It's such It's just a great physical, physical action you can do in a game. Mystery bags are the best. <laughs> We're going to have to sneak some like random things into the mystery bags we play with so that Mark can have even better experiences. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving off of that, have you had any games that you initially loved or hated only to find yourself feeling the opposite after a few plays? Um, I'll say The Resistance. I kind of wasn't sure at first because it's not really my type of game, and then I grew to love it. And then we played it 50 times, and I kind of got tired of it. So that's yeah. kind of the, the up and down life cycle of that one for me. And I feel like if it took you 50 plays to get there, that's okay. Oh, we got our money's like, worth out like, of resistance. Oh, yeah, resistance absolutely. Or, I'm not yeah. taking anything away right, from it. Right, it's just right. that I'm at a point where I'm not yeah. excited about playing the game it's, anymore. It's played out. Any the, for you, Matt? The one that I thought of, and this is probably just an instance of overreaction in both directions uh near and far if you remember like the first two or three games we played i loved it Mm -hmm. i thought it was great and then we hit the end of that short campaign and i was just so frustrated with how the campaign ended yeah um honestly i think the game is solidly in between those two experiences sure but, I had but struck, you kind of end with a bad I can't, taste. So. I can't remember going from so hot to so cold so quickly. <laughs> yeah. The two games that really improved after my first couple of plays would be Zulkin. Because I liked it at first. And then, as I wrote about in the review, I really burned out when I was trying to play a couple games online. And I just saw how far the strategy could go. And I had to kind of cleanse myself. But then we played it recently a couple of times. And it's been really fun. It's been really enjoyable. That's just a a, a fantastically designed game. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but Netrunner, I played... You got into it first, Orion, and then Mm -hmm. you tried to get me into it, and I played a couple games. I'm like, eh, I don't really get it. And then like a year and a half later... It's like, why do they have to name the things? Why can't it just be an action and a money? Why does it have to be a click and a credit? It's so hard to learn. And an HQ and an R&D and a stack and a grip and... Some of that I agree with, and some of that it's just it's just part of the game. They have names for things, and, and it's ultimately a, worth it. Oh yeah, but and it's it is a hard. I, I enjoyed a lot of the humor in some of the the names of things, like the stack and the heat being the runners, like yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I came back to it a year and a half later, and now I'm obsessed. Then I found two that declined in my mind. The first one would be Catan which is one of the first games that I really enjoyed. And it hasn't really declined a lot more than like nearly every game. Maybe 80% of the games I've played since then are just better. It's not a bad game. It's just there's so many better games out there. And then I'm actually going to agree with you on Near and Far. I I was hot on it at first, and then I played a bit more, and then I just suddenly had no desire to play it anymore. So I I need to get back and finish my campaign with Ben, but I don't know how it's going to be. It, it it's yeah. an interesting case. It has it has some things that really are going for it. I mean I I mean it's got a lot of form to call back to our earlier discussion. Absolutely, the art's amazing. Yeah, if nothing else, that book, the map book, is brilliant, and yeah, um, it takes above and below and and expands on the the artistic theme. Yeah. <laughs> but, for me, I think Near and Far is one that I enjoyed more at the beginning, and then as we played it more, it just it became less interesting, and I'm not as hot on it anymore. Yeah, it almost reminds it just me kinda of like made, um, whatever I don't know some random like 4x computer games, where like 
does it have the power to like is the enjoyment of exploring always going to be fun or is it or is it more just like figuring out how to explore that's fun that's a good point and like near and far felt it was so fun to like go through the map the first time but i don't know well you Later see on, through the joy you, wasn't you see there. through the theme really easily and i think the part of the what knocked it down for me is that you can see through it so easily and then it just becomes a game about optimizing when it should be yeah. a game about having adventures yeah i think that's a problem with form and function not serving each other yeah that might be a perfect example because we love optimization games and we love the theme. But I don't want that game to be an optimization game. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question about game mechanisms or games specifically. And this one's an interesting one. I think you've talked about this a bit to me before, Matt. And the question is, where do you stand on the breadth versus depth approach to gaming? And the questioner is asking in, about in terms of playing a lot of different games versus playing a few games a lot. I'm curious what you're thinking of as what we've talked about in the past. I feel like, in general, I'm a breadth gamer. Maybe we all are, because we just get a lot of games for this. But So so this is, this is the key thing. I think I enjoy the process of learning a game. And that wasn't all, always the case. But we got to a point where, like, in our group, we were playing new games all the time. And I just, I really enjoy figuring out a game for the first time. So that that's a breadth approach now that's not the whole story so so like i mean the depth thing like there have been games dominion's the obvious example i've gotten at one point in time this is a while ago now i was deeper into dominion than any other board game that I, i've been in into and just constantly playing it in and kind of like <laughs> refining the gameplay to the point where like you're worrying about little decisions that you just don't worry about when you first start playing. Like, that's so fun. It's so fun to get great at a game and explore all the depth of the game. I don't know, what, what were you thinking? Oh, I thought you, you had mentioned to me once a few months ago that you really wanted to focus... You would prefer to, you know, pick oh. a few games that we just play more often rather than learning new games. Oh, I, I don't remember saying that. I remember... I remember talking about not being able to get into all the new games you were getting. Yeah, just maybe I, I, I misinterpreted. Yeah, I think just because I'm not able to come over here as much as I once did. I don't yeah, know, I'm yeah. over here maybe once or twice a week rather than two or three times yeah. a week. And, and, and with the heavy games, like uh, I think the first one was Fire in the Lake, where I just realized like to, to get into this game, to experience the game the way that it's meant to be played, I need to devote... 12 hours to playing through it a couple of times. Right. And I just was like, there are other games that I'd rather spend that 12 hours playing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think honestly, as a group, we're pretty balanced on this. Yeah. Like I don't definitely. think compared to, to many people that at least I read about in the board gaming world, like we don't acquire games that rapidly. Like yeah. I was checking and I, I do a cool stuff order like once every three months about. Okay. So that's two to three games every three months. That's not that much compared to some people. I mean, it's it's certainly a hobby. And I'm it feels so fast. I there's so many games that I feel we've left in the dust and just never get back to because we're constantly playing new games. And I enjoy the new games and I enjoy learning them and we're, they're almost always good. But like, I want to go play Rebellion a dozen times, you know? And yeah. We've played yeah. It a, we've played it a decent amount, and I I really like like Triumph and Tragedy. I want to play that so much, but we never yeah. get it out. Yeah. We played it twice or two or three times. True. And we're always playing. We're always playing new games, and I, so I, I again I enjoy that part, but I'm more on the depth side. And there's yeah. a lot of games that I would I would rather just go back and play those a bunch of times. I mean, it's certainly like sorry, Europe, Europea, Europe, Europe, Europe. Europe. Europe, sorry. Europa Universal. Europa that you play. Like, yeah. I know you you put a lot of time into that, yeah, but it's the kind of game where you can dive into the depth and so many different aspects of the depth. Yeah, there's so many different details and, that's and so systems rewarding. going on. Yeah, the Netrunner, you guys. Yeah, Netrunner is the one that you know that I've I've decided to kind of go into. Castle and... of Burgundy is the other one. 
Yeah, I mean, that one's just really easy to play online, and I enjoy but you it a lot. It 400 times or something. Right, but it's not necessarily like rewarding me with all kinds of new experiences or anything. It's just. You it's just like something I do now. It's it's relaxing. Okay. It's not like Netrunner where I'm constantly learning and reevaluating my my thoughts on certain cards and certain strategies and new decks and, and new decks and yeah. stuff. But I will say, I mean, I I would not be able to get into another game like Netrunner. Mm-hmm. Like I just choose not to. I can't. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. that's so much brain power and so much time yeah. and a lot of money, honestly. So back in the day, I don't know. Before we were like. Before we knew that like board gaming was our thing, we kind of started playing Resistance. That was the first game that we were like, every time we get together, we're going to play. Yeah. And that was a depth experience. Now, I think as Orion said earlier, like we kind of explored the depth. We kind of wrung every we, bit of every strategy bit out of out that of game. With our group. In, in, but that was a depth gaming experience yeah. that was incredibly rewarding. Then we decided we love board games, and we bought games a lot more frequently. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard. Now that I'm reviewing games and getting review copies, like, there are going to be more games to play. But I, I think I think Orion's right. Like, we do need to maybe slow down a bit. I say as I've, you know, made a purchase just the other day of a couple of new games. As of, did I? As, as That's right. You did, too. But... Yeah, there are a lot of games I would really like to revisit. The the hard part's the logistics, like finding people have the time or who logistics. want to all play the same game. Yeah, and you know, it's easier with the, the the slightly lighter games. We have classics that we keep going back to. We bring out Scythe every every so often. We haven't played Scythe that much. I bet we haven't played Scythe more than five times. Yeah. I've played Scythe. I think I've played Scythe now. five times. Only five times? Yeah. Or I feel like it's been fairly regular. Like, every couple months. We just no. looked at the play. achievement sheet, and no. we haven't, hadn't played it since... Um, since PAX East. Since PAX East. without you guys? Maybe. Um, I don't think there are any games we pull out regularly. I mean, I if know, there are like, lots like, of people even, around, Codenames is going to come out. Not super regular. Not, like, not once a month, but like even like Viticulture. Viticulture like, was pretty regular for a while, yeah. That's a game we're going to go but we, to. But we haven't played Viticulture in probably three or four months Yeah. by this point. Yeah. There's we're just a lot honestly, of games. Honestly, Twilight Imperium might be our most regular our my, game. <laughs> yeah, we hit we it, what, three, it three to four times a year, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I just saw Power Grid. We haven't played Power Grid in so long. That'd be a fun one to pull out again. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we do need to slow down I'm and curious. prioritize some games. You know I'm what curious. would be interesting? We should make some kind of way to communicate like games like especially these older games not older older for us that we really want to play again just notify each other hey i really itching to play this game yeah and then try to organize it like we do with twilight imperium where we actually organize time to to play the game that might be something to do in the slack channel or something like that that's a good idea i mean there are things that people do there's the 10 for 10 by 10 challenge have you seen that no the board game people do no it's like a new year's resolution kind of thing where people will choose 10 games and they say we're going to play each of these 10 games 10 times that each. year that year in that year oh, okay nice. and so they chart it i don't think it's a great system because 10 plays of one game is can be completely different than 10 plays of another game but i think it'd be fun to create some way of prioritizing games that we haven't played in a while that people want to play like triumph and tragedy or terra mystica we've been trying to get terra mystica out for a long time yeah I'm curious what other people think of that, especially like people who are really into the hobby. Well, yeah, what do, well what, I mean, what, a what lot do the of listeners think like, do you try to be depth gamers? Do you enjoy just playing a bunch of new games? Well, I how think, do you experience the hobby? Well, I think there's a there's kind of an inherent enjoyment out of acquiring and learning new games. Like it's fun to open up the box. It's it, at least to me, it's fun to look through the rules for the first time to kind of get that new experience yeah. in your mind you know what else the legacy games have taught me that that's important like honestly like i think i think that playing through pandemic legacy was a paradigm shift in my in my mind where like i'm totally okay with the idea that a board game can be an experience that is enjoyed and then set aside kind of yeah like so many other things you know in life are like going to see a movie it's an experience. Yeah. Well, part of every once in a while, I look at the shells and like, man, you know, we don't play this game enough. We don't play that game enough. And I kind of console myself by thinking like, you know, 
excluding some kind of, you know, flood or dropping into a trash compactor accidentally. Like, I'm going to have these games if I want to pretty much the rest of my life. Yeah. And when you look at it in those terms, like, I'm going to have kids someday, I'm sure, and it'd be super fun to start teaching them games when they're growing up. And, you know, I look forward to the time when I get to teach, you know, maybe my 12-year-old Twilight Struggles. Like, hey, let's learn about (laughs) history and play this game. When looking at it from that perspective, it's like, okay, I have a lot of time to play these games. There's only so much space, so I'll be honing my collection throughout time. And 10 years from now, I'm going to have an amazing collection of games that I'm going to have played them a few times each. And when I look at it from that way, it seems okay. But I think we need to find a way to schedule yeah. plays of games like Terramisca that we haven't played. We haven't played that in over this a year, probably. This is so many interesting ideas. I mean, I know. when I think of, like, my parents' game cabinet, game game closet. <laughs> yeah, game closet. Um, like, it was really good, I think, for that generation. And Like, growing up, we had tons of games. We had a fair number. I loved categories were, as a kid. But those games were from a different era. They don't have... They're not as good as this era's games. Oh, sure. When I look at this gaming wall, like... Yeah, when you have kids, this is going to be so much better. And, and Oh, it's going to be sweet. The experiences are going to be worth more, I think, than just playing Candyland. Yeah, Candyland's fine for, for a, a year or so. But, like, it, Are you it's saying it's, a, it's it, oh, Candyland? It's fine if you're, like, a year old, maybe. But it's not even really a game. There are no well, choices in Candyland. Yeah, no, right. So, like, <laughs> I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I just want to make our, our Candyland, cl- the thoughtful gamer Candyland position, very clear. It is a horrible thing. I guess I'm just saying that like 20 years ago. Yeah, when you were a child. Candyland as one of 50 games in a game closet is fine. and like, But uh, those games don't stand up against the games that we have now that yeah. you'll have in your game closet. Yeah. Yeah, which is really fun. Yeah. One thing to add on to this that I've just noticed about myself and I've been thinking about recently is that I tend to find something I like. And then just go back to it. And once I find something that I'm happy with, I tend to just keep picking that. Whether it's a sandwich at the deli, or an order at a restaurant, or a board game, or a video game, or things like that. I gravitate towards that. And I will... It's not that I don't like new things, but I think i'm fairly good at finding something that i know i'll like and then i'm just happy to keep choosing that yeah i think you're more that way than than either of us i well i'm that way with music as we talked about before right but i don't know with board games specifically i like i mean because like matt you talked about you really like learning a game and kind of figuring a game out and figuring out its strategy and we talked about this on a previous podcast i don't remember which one but you you like kind of solving, in very loose terms, solving the game and like really figuring out the strategy and understanding how how that works. I really enjoy figuring out a game out in terms of understanding the designer's thought process as he was designing the game and the decisions that they made to create interesting decisions within the game. I like seeing the game as kind of an extension of someone else's design which it is yeah that's interesting i mean i like the strategy and such but i think part of that kind of guides me toward really enjoying the new game experience although i also you know some games like you can go back to over and over and over again and still get new and interesting things this isn't unique to board gaming like books are the same way like books and movies and people who love books they they you know you want to, to to read more new experiences and i think in the same way kind of you want to understand what an author has to say right whether it be fiction or non-fiction they have something to say and and it's worth getting many experiences reading different books but there will always be those books that are worth reading over and over again throughout your life yeah and part of doing a bit of self i don't know psychology i've always described myself as an enthusiast like i like I like the experience of getting into something like, you know, when I did, when I discovered that, oh, there's all these kinds of beer, I really 
started seeking out different kinds of beer and understanding yeah. the differences and how they're constructed and, and getting all of those flavors. Same when I learned about wine for my job at one point. Same with video games a little bit, although I'm it's very hard for me to start a brand new video game. I end up falling back to a lot of really comfortable ones just because, not because I really enjoy them like you or Ryan enjoy Europa, but I fall back to like really you, you not play dumb. the same uh, baseball simulation game all the time. Well, the baseball simulation game is a masterpiece of design. <laughs> if anyone here likes sports simulations, out of the park baseball is, is really an incredible feat. And when I say sports simulation, I mean just simulation. <laughs> Like, it's a game of just spreadsheets. It's amazing. But I fall back on those kinds of games. Or even games like, you know, I, I started playing Mini Metro again. And that's yeah. that's a game that will last you really, like, two or three hours. And you're like, okay, I've experienced this game. But then I just fell back. I haven't played in a while. I started playing it again. Because, you know, I have, like, over 100 games on Steam that I've bought for pennies through yeah. Humble Bundles and such. Yeah. And I've only played maybe a quarter of them. Right. That's if the, that's that. the Steam library conundrum. You keep finding these sales. You're like, oh, I should buy this game. It's so cheap. And then you never yeah. play it. Which is great and fine. I'm glad to Someday contribute to people's... Someday when I'm stuck on a desert island with nothing but my gaming PC, <laughs> I will give up playing them all. Right. But anyway, accepting video games, I really like immersing myself in something. And I guess with board games, it's not necessarily been in a particular game although netrunner a bit but it's just learning what i can about different designs and different types of yeah. games and genres and subgenres. like you know talk about someone who wanted to play train games with us and like that's right. something we've never done but that's a very important sh- subgenre within board gaming i was talking earlier we haven't you know, we play lots of GMT games, but we haven't yet gotten a Hex Encounter game, and Hex Encounter War games are a very important subgenre. So I'm really looking forward to kind of diving into these really specific types of games. Yeah. Like, it's kind of shameful as a reviewer. I've never played a Martin Wallace game, but <laughs> I'm excited to get into it. That's that's what excites me, is just figuring out things. Okay. That's incredibly vague. <laughs> but I hope I hope it's understandable. <laughs> Well, and part of it is just, it's an economic problem, right? It's a, it's a marginal, okay. Marginal well, utility? It's not marginal <laughs> utility. It's, it has to do with preference orders. But let's talk about a little bit of economic history. A very important part of economics is what's called the marginalist revolution, where we have this idea of marginalism, which basically says that if you have a given supply of something, everyone has a, a preference list. Not that they've actually listed it out, but they have a list of preferences of what they're going to do with that. So say you have, you know, maybe you're you're poor and starving somewhere in a third world country and you have a gallon of water. You have a preference list for that. Top of that is probably drinking some water so you don't die. But if you had two gallons, maybe you'd use the first gallon for the first preference and and satisfy that. And then you'd use the second gallon to make sure your goats have water, something like that. And then okay. way down the list, it's it's okay. stuff like cleaning Sporting cleaning your feet, you know, things. What you down the list? I didn't even hear what you said. Oh, squirt water guns? Yeah, yeah squirt water gun. water balloons. Yeah, somewhere down the list, there's water balloons, and that's like fundamental to all economic decisions is thinking about using goods on the margin. You're always going to use the highest thing on your preference list. Example of this in games would be playing on the curve in something like Hearthstone, you know, playing your five mana card. Yeah, kind of. Instead yeah. instead of on the five turn instead of waiting till the seven turn or something because you get more relative value generally yeah. by playing the most expensive thing you can with or using all your resources that turn. To play the most expensive thing you can. Yeah, as there's there's thing. some parallels there. Little tidbit, opportunity cost, as defined in economics, is the the cost of whatever the, the thing you've forfeited next on your preference list is, or the value of that thing. Okay. That's the technical definition. But anyway, when it comes to things like games, we have an allotment of time. Yeah. Right? We have a supply of time. And it's just a matter of how our preference lists look. Orion's preference list is play Europa, play Europa, play Europa. And then 
maybe play some other game or play Rebellion, play Rebellion, play Rebellion a third time, play Twilight Struggle. Like, whereas our preference lists look like, ooh, brand new game. <laughs> another different brand new game. And then maybe, you know, third yeah. is a game we haven't played in yeah, a while. Yeah, you have to consider, right? you know, with time as the, the currency, Falling Sky has a greater right. cost than a game of dominion yeah so it's about it's about the allotment of time and how we value things on the margin given that scarcity and that's why scarcity is another incredibly important concept in economics isn't it like the foundation of all economics yeah i mean scarcity yes kind of i mean if you had to pick one keystone it would be scarcity right scarcity of time would probably be the fundamental thing because okay. that that's where you get choice and from choice you get preferenceless and then from that you get marginalism mm. and from that you can you can literally deduce and i did this i had to in, in one of my tests in in micro <laughs> micro econ uh like 101 in college i had to go through 12 different logical steps of deduction from the fact that humans have to make choices to oh i can't remember i think all the way to the supply and demand graph and you can deduce it all from that assumption. So that's why demand always goes down to the right, supply goes up, and it all has to do with marginalism. That was a huge tangent, and I think I that, enjoyed that. And I mean, it's now it's now on brand, right? The last podcast was I think over fifty yeah. percent tangents with Michael, and we got into Nazis. So yeah. I guess I'm now glad, we can get into marginalism. I'm glad that you were clear on that. Nazis are bad. There was no. Uh, no ambiguity. I think we did real well with our Nazi position. Yeah. <laughs> Props to you and Michael. That was, you know, you can slip up. Like, look at look at our president. Let's move on to uh, questions about the podcast and the Thoughtful Gamer itself. Why did you decide to start podcasting? And I think I just kind of was like, hey, let's grab a mic and podcast. Do you guys remember? It was right after PAX East. Yeah. Um. Well, we were just kind of all talking about PAX, and I, I, you or Wes was like, we should just record this and start well, making a podcast. Well, I was a big fan of this idea from the beginning. I was because, skeptical, of, cause, skeptical of it. Because I thought, I love talking to you guys about games. I think that we have great things. Uh, we have great ideas. We have good discussions, at least. And it's better when you're we're hashing it out together. Well, that's an interesting thing, because I naturally... I feel like I'm better with speaking just because, you know, I did debate for so many years and extemporaneous speaking, but I appreciate writing a lot more. And I think writing is an inherently better medium to communicate ideas because you can be more precise. You know, you can be very precise with your words and because the reader, if they get stuck a bit can go back and read again you can't really do that with a speech speech has other benefits of like persuasion and riling up emotions and kind of non-verbal communication can be good and sure. bad so as great as dex side talks with mark are, i think the real benefit of this podcast is the exchange of ideas yes and and hopefully people who are listening to this benefit from that and when a light bulb goes off in my head because of something that you've said, we can we can dig in deeper. Anyway, yeah, I, I guess it's somewhat Socratic. Yes, yeah. This is what I was most excited for with the thoughtful gamer. Just yeah, so I guess I can show up and talk. Yeah, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write any articles. <laughs> so. Well, I guess the 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 string of events was I was like, oh, maybe I'll do a podcast, see how that goes. And I knew I do wanted to do some stuff, so I I bought the mic. And then Wes shows up with two other mics. He's like, hey, here's you know a little thing to get you going. And I was like, okay. And then I'm like, well, we're all here for PAX East. Let's just talk about PAX and see you know, how it goes. And it ended up being surprisingly fun and surprisingly easy. Like, I don't do a ton of editing for the podcast. And I guess, you know, some people have, like, different segments and they do lots of, you know, music interspersed. You know, I slap on a bit of music at the beginning of it and the end and I cut out ums, basically. That's what I do. Or, or long pauses or people clearing their throat. Or airplanes flying. Or airplanes flying overhead. And it just was really enjoyable and really easy. So I guess we do it because it's fun. It's really I find it really fun. 
I am probably way more of an external processor than the two of you are, just in personality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like, for me, I love playing games, but at a certain point, I'm getting more enjoyment from games by sitting here and processing it in conversation. Oh, that's that's interesting. And, like, we're going to do that to some extent anyway. This is a kind of a formal way where we're like, okay, here's a topic, here's a time, we're going to put mics in front of us. Yeah. I think some of the most enjoyable parts for me is rehashing, like, when we play Twilight Imperium and then podcasting about it the next day. Yeah. It's a blast because then it was all still fresh in our head and the yeah. experience and we're going back and forth and kind of reliving that. That was great. Yeah, I and I agree, and I think that's... I'm going to try to get more of those like really deep dives into games we've played recently. I think I want to make a lot of episodes about that. So those have often been the episodes that I get a lot more positive feedback on too. Like people love our Mage Knight episode. Yeah. <laughs> I've gotten I think more my other favorite is the uh, War of the Ring versus Rebellion. I've gotten a lot of positive games. feedback on that. That was yeah. a really that might fun have been episode. That's my favorite episode to record. Yeah. That was a really good one. Yeah. We got to do another one on, on on some kind of game. We'll see. All right. Next question. Has it been hard to stand out as a relative newcomer in board games? Is it challenging to find listeners? And how am I trying to stand out? I actually get a lot more listeners of the podcast, at least from what I can tell, than I do, at least consistently, than I do from articles on the website. So I think people love... like. I don't listen to that many podcasts, but I think there are a lot of people like you, Matt, who listen to a lot of podcasts. Well, I guess both of you guys listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. And I haven't had a ton of trouble getting a, you know, a small number of consistent listeners. How am I trying to stand out? Well, I mean, my original pitch that I wrote up and I think I sent out, you know, a couple of years ago was like, I looked at the state of board game criticism, I looked at the big players. I'm like, okay, the Dice Tower, they do quantity very well. They do very, you know, they, they review all the games. They're the biggest. They do all the lists and they do they a do all the lists. They do a rules thing and then a quick, like, what we thought. And they have format. that format, yeah. The go over how the game plays, a little bit of thoughts at the end. They're like, okay, what's the next biggest one? Shut up and sit down. They've got humor. We can't really beat them on humor. <laughs> uh, we don't. We're not as good looking. I speak for myself. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't have accents. Also, they and do, also they do. They're really good at video. Yeah, like they're they really do high quality good. video. They do scripts for their stuff and a lot of like funny skits and you know, yeah. And they put a ton of effort into yeah. that. So yeah. I'm like, I can't compete with them there. I can't. I can't compete with the dice tower on quantity or newness on getting all the new games what's missing and what was missing was exactly what i really enjoyed doing and that's really thoughtful critical reviews of games and then going really in depth into discussions of of games and game culture and all that so that's how i've tried to stand out i think it's been at least on a very small scale. Like obviously, we're nowhere near yeah. those two players. Right, right. But I right. think I found a little bit of a niche to stand out in, and I'm hoping you know people appreciate it. And so that's been my strategy. I've said this before. I'm not good at social media, so I'm never gonna win out there. But I'm hoping to get you know a small group of loyal listeners who can spread the word and slowly grow that up. You know, from being a bit unique here i know there are other podcasts and other places that do go in depth too but i think they're a very small minority of the people doing board game stuff online and then last question where would you like to see the thoughtful gamer go in the future as i said before i'd like to slowly build up a good you know loyal audience who appreciates this kind of of information i mean my optimistic okay my hubristic <laughs> view and very pompous sounding like end goal i guess is i want to be known as kind of like the roger ebert of board gaming like the person who really knows the subject really talks very succinctly and elegantly about you know whatever he's reviewing and someone that people can trust to give really good honest reviews about games and part of that now is because we see you know, a lot of places where reviewers are taking money from publishers to review games. That whole controversy I've talked about. Part of it is, again, I don't see a lot of people doing really in-depth criticism of games. I want to be the person who 
does it right. And that sounds horrible and, and again, pompous, but that's the best way I can communicate my goals. And I yeah. think, and I think I, I do that through getting again, some loyal people who follow and listen and slowly building my audience. I think that also, and I want the trust of the audience. That's what I want. I want to be, I want people to trust uh, what I say that it's honest and has been given thought. And I think that very much plays to your strengths and the way you would approach board games, even if you weren't trying to review them. Yeah. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm being honest yeah. in that sense think... is that that's just who I am. That's, I overthink everything. Yeah. Everyone who knows me knows this or who has discussed movies with me knows this. Yeah. in in um, I mean, in your written content, like you're very clear about why, why you like something or don't like something down to you know it, getting into the nitty-gritty of it in a way that like people can read that and not only i mean they can trust what you're saying i think is part of the idea but also they can understand why you're saying what you're saying and perhaps they have different goals and that it's valuable to hear what you have to say even if their goals are slightly different because you're not just doing a rundown of the rules and then be like this is how i feel that probably sounds mean but yeah and i don't again i don't want to criticize the dice tower shop and sit down they're they're awesome uh i just want to be different than them like i can't compete with them and i guess the ultimate thing is i want the trust of the audience that's what i want And, and like you say that you know my number one rule of writing the reviews and such has been explain why you know warrant your claims as i would tell my debate students like you have to explain why you think the statement is true. And hopefully I've been doing that all right. As far as the future of the Thoughtful Gamer, we t- I talked about this, I, or I announced it in last week's podcast where I went into the, you know, the near future on October 15th. I'm going to be launching the Patreon campaign for the Thoughtful Gamer to try to improve my equipment quality and improve what I'm producing here and also prepare for PAX Unplugged, which we're going to be at I'm moving a bit more into video and into streaming. I'll do uh, board game streams periodically and slowly progressing towards doing things like video reviews or how to play videos in in cases where I think there's a lack of good how to play. Like, you know, you have um, watch it play. Like, I'm not going to be able to compete with them. But if there's a game that I think would be a good candidate for learning how to play it through a video and they haven't covered it, I'll try to do it like Mage Knight. That's going to be my first one. And then very long term, I'd also like to start designing some games or at least trying to design some games and kind of chart my progress and my thought processes on the blog as well. So that's kind of where the Thoughtful Gamer is going in the future. Uh, the big thing's the Patreon campaign to try to gauge a bit of interest. So I'm I'm a bit nervous about that. But obviously continuing the written stuff and uh, the podcast. I have some like real like myopic thoughts, I guess. Just in like where I like to see things go. Like with the with the podcast, I love the interviews you've done. Oh which yeah. Are, like, the episodes that don't involve me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like game designer that you interviewed Emil. Emil. Yep. And then last, Michael, last yeah. week, Michael with uh, Neapos Like Us. Like, those are just incredibly interesting conversations. And there are other people in the board gaming community that have such interesting, so many great thoughts. And I think playing to your strength is probably bringing those out. Yeah, I would love to do a lot more interviews on the podcast. I mean, ult- the ultimate goal, obviously, is to get Vlada on the, ca- on the podcast <laughs> yes. and then try not to like worship him. Uh, <laughs> but, but instead ask some good questions, but I'd love to get, you know, talk to designers and do re again, really deep, thoughtful, intelligent discussions with these people and really pick their brains and ask the hard questions and ask the, the ones that are going to make them think I would love to do more, more like that. But, you know, I feel like I need to build up my audience a bit more before I start asking like, you know, Eric Lang or something. Uh, you know, I'm really interested in, in becoming better at interviewing people and trying to find like books or something to learn how to interview people. Yeah. Uh, cause I think it's a, it's a very strange thing to do. Huh, it feels, it's not like a discussion we're having here. It's a very, it's a very weird experience, much more than I thought it would be. Huh. And I want to get really good at it. I think it's a fun skill. 
That's all the questions we had for the Q&A podcast listener spectacular. I think I mixed up some of the words there for my original title. I still feel spectacular. Good for you, Matt. Don't forget to visit the website at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Facebook. And also don't forget to rate and review this on iTunes. I think that's all the social media stuff. Oh, follow me on Twitch. I'm on Twitch if you want to watch games being played live on our cool board game table. That's the podcast for today. Thanks for listening and we will talk to you again next week. Bye. See you. Bye.